Nice. Beautiful. Thanks. Somebody Perfect. Can... Somebody commented in the chat how much they liked it. Talking market was recently repaired uh, with this I wrapped elk sinew from uh, Chuck LaRue. He gave it to me and I wrapped it around the top because it was cracked at the bottom. Um, so Somebody this... just wrote in the Q&A asking where they can buy the record. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't think it exists. <laughs> Well, we are right at 4 p.m., y'all, so we can go ahead and get started. All right. Nice. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm David Boyle with Crow Canyon, and uh, I've got a few guests here with me. We're going we're gonna to get started. Hope everybody's logged in and doing well today. Um, this is Return to House of Rain, Part 1 with Craig Childs. We're going uh, to start with some thank yous here, go through some slides. Special thanks to all of you for showing up, first of all, first and foremost. We really appreciate you being here and supporting Crow Canyon and, and being part of our webinar series. We can't do it in person, but we're so happy to be able to do it this way and, and still connect. Uh, special thanks to Dylan and Taylor for all the work behind the scenes. And um, her name's not on here, but Laura Brown did so much work uh, to put this video together for us. And um, we're all adding new titles to our to our, uh, our resumes and filmmaker is now with Laura. So thank you. Um, also want to say thanks to Aztec Ruins National Monument and Chaco Culture and National Historic Park for letting Craig run around and film down there and um, just for your support. So thank you. A little bit of technical stuff here. Um, if you're seeing talking heads like my head and Craig's and Mark's, you can move us around just by kind of clicking on it and dragging around once the video starts. And you can also, uh, under the view button, move us to the top of your screen or to the side, um, kind of play around with it. And uh, I see somebody talking about volume. Make sure your volume's up. And um, live transcription is a new thing. It's going to be. Uh, kind of popping up at the bottom of your screen. And if that is something that you want to turn off at the bottom of your screen, there's a, a button for that. You can click on it and turn it off. And it's kind of a new thing. So um, play around with that. If you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A. Um, we know that there are a lot of people logged on right now. And so we probably aren't going to get to a lot of your questions, but this is a great video and you're going to get to hear from um, Craig and Mark and you'll, you'll get a lot. So uh, we'll, we'll try and do what we can. If you are having difficulties streaming this, you can also go to Facebook, uh, crowcanyon.org, Facebook, and we're live there as well. Um, and if all else fails, uh, you can go to YouTube later. We'll have this on um, usually to, within 24 hours or so, it'll be logged on. To, you can get onto Facebook and watch it. Um, and like and subscribe us, that really helps us out, uh, gain our foothold out there in the, in the wide world. Okay. Our mission here at Crow Canyon is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges Pueblo, Ute, Diné, Hickorya, and Paiute people whose traditional homelands we work and reside. We are grateful to all the indigenous people who continue to preserve and protect cultural traditions, maintain ancestral relationships, and steward the lands that we live on. It would not be generous or it would not be possible uh, for us to do what we do at Crow Canyon without the many generations of people that we pay homage to every day. Of course, our next webinar is uh, the second chapter, the second, maybe it's not a chapter, the second episode of Return to House of Rain. So um, 
just a reminder, if you're signed up and you're here, you're already signed up for that one too. And it'll be on the same link and we'll send that out uh, on Thursday, right before the webinar happens again, just like you did got a, a reminder today. So you don't need to re-register. You're signed up for both episodes. And that's going to be next Thursday, March 4th, same time. We like to share this, um, this slide with you folks. A lot of people have asked, how can we help our, our community, Pueblo and uh, Native communities around the Southwest we know have been hit so hard in the pandemic? Um, there's some relief funds here that go directly into those communities and they're really helpful. And as um, you know, we're all still struggling, they are especially. So um, if you are so motivated, this is a great way to help out those communities. Um, if you don't have a pen and paper and can't write that down right now, when you go, if you look on YouTube, you can pause it at this spot and write those down and, and get links to them. It's a great way to, to help out those communities. Okay, I'm going to introduce Craig, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to Mark here in a minute for a little bit of a, a little more history. Um, Craig Childs, as most of you know, is an author, and he's written over a dozen books. Most recently, Virga and Bone, Essays from Dry Places in 2019, Atlas of a Lost World in 2018, House of Rain, which we're here to revisit from in 20, 2007. Doesn't seem like it could be that long ago, Craig. Uh, first book. It was 1995, Stone Desert Explorations in the Canyonlands National Park, which is out of print. I did find one the other day. Uh, they're few and far between now. Uh, Craig has won the Orion Book Award and twice won the Sigurd F. Olson Nature Writing Award, Galen Rowell Art of Adventure Award, and the Spirit of the West Award for his body of work. He is contributing editor at Adventure Journal Quarterly, and his writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Men's Journal, Outside, and we see him regularly on The Last Word on Nothing, which are great, short, fun articles. It's a really good, really good uh, publication. Craig has a bachelor's in journalism from CU Boulder and a master's in desert studies from Prescott College. He is an occasional commentator on NPR's Morning Edition, and he teaches writing at University of Alaska in Anchorage and Southern New Hampshire University. Craig was introduced to Crow Canyon uh, and Mark Varian in the early 2000s. Date kind of unknown, um, maybe 2002. And he's been a scholar for, uh, worked with Crow Canyon on a handful of trips that we do in the Southwest through our cultural explorations department where we go out in the field uh, for usually about a week at a time with archaeologists and uh, native scholars and really study archaeology in a, in a hands-on in a different kind of a way. So our last trip was uh, on the cusp is the only word I can come up with of the pandemic. Uh, we were we were the last ones out in the desert. It felt like out in the bear's ears for a week. Um, and it was a wonderful trip. And uh, we hope to do that again soon. I want to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Varian. He's the executive vice president of a research institute at Crow Canyon and the Ricky R. Lightfoot Chair in Research to give us a little bit more history about Crow Canyon and Craig. Mark? Hi, thank you so much, uh, David, and thanks, Craig, for doing these two webinars. Um, yeah, I'm the, uh, I'm the longest tenured employee here at Crow Canyon, having started in 1987. I first started doing archaeology in the Mesa Verde region in 1979. Um, uh, Craig has broken all records for webinar participants. We have about a thousand people on right now. So I know many of you might not know about Crow Canyon. We're located right outside of Cortez, Colorado, and that's a picture of our 170-acre campus uh, behind me with a probably the most iconic peak of the Four Corners, Sleeping Ute Mountain in the background, uh, which is the homeland of the Ute Mountain Ute Nation, our nearest native neighbors. Uh, Crow Canyon is a not-for-profit. Uh, David read you our mission, and we're really, really proud of that mission that brings, integrates these three areas of research, education, and partnerships with native communities. Um, we depend on folks like you for our support. So 
there is a donate button when you uh, register for these um, webinars and we'd be really grateful for any support you can give us. So it was about 2002 when I was sitting in my office. Uh, at that time, I was the uh, director of research at Crow Canyon and I uh, got a call from Craig and he mentioned that he had just done a reading of one of his newest books. I think it might have been The Soul of Nowhere because it was about 2002. And he had stayed with a friend of mine, Keith Kleber, in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, they broke the mold when they made Keith. He's a great guy. He and I dig bummed around the Southwest and the Northwest in the early 1980s together. Um, and But he had given up archaeology and had opened a trading post and gallery in Tucson. And uh, Craig read there, and I think then he stays with Keith uh, after that. And, he called and said that he had mentioned to Keith that he was getting ready to start the research for this new book he had an idea for, the book that became The House of Rain. And uh, Keith immediately said, well, you need to call my friend, Mark Varian, who works at the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. So I got that call, and I'm uh, ashamed to say I'd never read one of uh, Craig's books at that time. Uh, but I warmly welcomed him. He was living in Western Colorado, not far away. And I, I just told him, come anytime. We would love to have you come to the center and we'd like to help you in, in any way we can. Uh, so hung up the phone and I, I wandered uh, downstairs into the offices of two of our uh, top research archaeologists, Jonathan Till and Susan Ryan. I think you'll meet Susan next week on this uh, program. Um, and I, I said, wow, this guy Craig Giles just called me and he's a writer and explained what that he wanted to come visit and learn about what we do. And Susan and Jonathan just went nuts. Oh, Craig Giles, he's my favorite writer. Secret Knowledge of Water is my favorite book. No, mine's the soul of nowhere. Um, so I was feeling uh, like I had some, some, some background work that I needed to do. But it wasn't long, uh, just a few weeks before uh, Craig came, and that started this long relationship uh, with, with him and Crow Canyon that we're extremely grateful for. So, Craig, uh, with that context, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you again for doing this. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for years ago being willing to, uh, to meet me. Um, my beard was, was black. <laughs> so <laughs> that was that was some time ago and I you know I don't think that I House of Rain wouldn't have been the book that it was if if uh if I hadn't been taken in by Crow Canyon uh so so much incredible research comes out of there and uh, uh friends for life for me coming from that place um so so I think I I appreciate Crow Canyon just existing, what you guys do and, and, uh, and, and how much you add to the field of, of study. Um, I, I, I can't imagine what this book would have been without you, Mark, without you introducing me to so many researchers and, and, uh, and keeping the, the flow of information coming to me. Um, so House of Rain was, was uh, created, uh, it was probably a, a five year project or so writing the book and, and traveling and gathering the stories. And, um, and this series that we put together, the return to house of rain came out of um, the last year of this, this pandemic where so many, so many plans got rerouted uh, um, time in the field with uh, for teaching did not happen and and so david and i started talking about uh uh doing something like this i you know i said i'm i'm out there in the field a lot and i'm i'm seeing a lot of sites and and maybe i can get some clips and footage together and and kind of piece together the landscape i'm traveling through and and the visual uh sense of ancestry in this place because I, I think there's only so much you can really do with words in a book. I, I think they, they can do a lot, but, but my, I feel like my job as a writer is to take you there to this place. And I want you to see the color of the rock and I want you to sleep on the ground and, and know what it's like to be out there because it's so different from, um, 
from learning about it out of words. You're, you're learning about it out there where it's actually happening. And so that's why we put this together. So thank you, Crow Canyon, so much for, for being willing to do this. And, and Laura Brown, uh, who has become a filmmaker with this. I just, I send her the clips and I send her some ideas and then she, she has created this thing. Um, you know, my, my wife said that tonight, today, as she's watching this, that every time I say landscape or story, she's going to take a shot. <laughs> so we might have a wild night over here. <laughs> and because I have to be a coherent for a Q&A afterward, I'll abstain from this. <laughs> Uh, but but what you're about to see is uh, we're we're gonna jump all over the the Colorado Plateau. Um, I I want to give you a, a sense of of the House of Rain landscape and and what it is like out there and how I reflect on this place. So with that, I think Taylor, I think we're ready to go. Perfect. I'll go ahead and get the video started now. Okay, we are here, here being my rooftop at home in Southwest Colorado. Good place to get a vantage, a good place to start this. We're looking out across these Mesa flats and in between our canyons and farther out west, you can see that mountain range, that's the LaSalle Mountains in Utah. This is a place that is rich with history, not just the recent layer of a couple hundred years of, of rusted metal and roads, but a much older history of stone and masonry, pottery, baskets, corn, people who occupied this landscape, numbering more than anyone who lives here now. There's a deep history to this place. Everything out here is memory. I consider the whole landscape to be a sort of time machine. You look down and you see the, the dials and knobs on the ground. This is a stone tool, a blank preform on its way to being made into a knife blade or a projectile. It's probably three or 4,000 years old, desert archaic, and it comes from within 100 yards of the house. This is one of those knobs and dials of the time machine. There are smaller pieces. This came from right near the house. And it's an arrowhead, uh, or more likely an atlatl point. Uh, you can see the, the barbs. One is broken off here. This is where it would have been tied onto a shaft with sinew. And the tip is broken off. You look at these things, and time changes. Everything slows down. What was just a few inches becomes a few thousand years. What I'm doing here is putting together a series about human, ancient human ancestry in this landscape. How the shapes of this place change where people go, where people went, where they lived, where they migrated. I want to take you out there to the places that, that people lived uh, in situ, from the subtle to the bold. Years ago, I wrote a book called House of Rain, and it's where I was piecing together uh, the, the puzzle of, of the four corners in the southwest, because you walk out here and you see Pueblo ancestry around you. You see the, the cliff dwellings, the rubble mounds of great houses, pot sherds on the ground, and after a while, you begin to put them together and see that, that each piece is part of a much larger story. From the ruins and cliff dwellings up high to what they could see, what people were looking at, this high desert horizon, they're seeing the same places that we see now. 
my intention is to give you a, a sense of this visual tactile place where human presence is threaded through it, an inseparable part of it. It is a landscape of horizons where you can see from one to the next to the next. You make a map in your head of where you are, where you've been, who has been here before you. That horizon out there, that's Basket Maker. Basket Maker culture, at least 1,500 years old. One archaeologist who lives in this area did a 10-year survey along these, these rock faces in southwest Colorado. And he thinks what we're looking at is, is possibly 2,000 years old, if not older. Uh, classic triangle-shaped shoulders, trapezoidal body, big hands, big feet. Don't ask me what it means. It was 1,000 years ago. Even people who know don't know. Early corn growers, basket makers, based on burials, artifacts, and their ongoing history that reaches out to modern people, these were a highly ritualized people, and they occupied this land horizon to horizon. Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and obviously here in Colorado. You look at these individual figures and what are you seeing? Stories, legends, spirits, mysteries. They meant something precise in their day, enough to set them in stone. I mean, what is this guy here? This figure with, it looks human, but instead of arms, it looks like it has wings. Not too different from this one over here, where those don't look like arms either. They look like wings. What story are we hearing here? What information is being conveyed? From here, I can almost see home. If, if I parted this juniper tree and, uh, and that rim, canyon rim over there, just, just slipped it back like a curtain, I'd look 30 miles away and see my kitchen window. I've been putting pins in this landscape, in this map for most of my life orienting myself to to what is here now what was here a thousand years ago i call this place home but it's home not just for me let's get oriented to this place home it's important to know how deep the concept goes let me read something to you from house of rain from the prologue I hesitate using the term pre-Columbian, defining the chronicles of ancient America by the arbitrary date of Christopher Columbus's first visit in 1492. Prehistoric is just as troublesome a term, suggesting a time before history that passed pure and unnoticed. Yet these words, however insufficient, give an ample impression of antiquity, telling of a time long before the age of steel in America, and before the domestic horse, an era predating Columbus, prior to most notions of history. Time seems very thin in this landscape, as if one could reach across a thousand years merely by crouching over a lost knife blade made of crystal-shot jasper, feeling its edge still sharp enough to draw blood. The desert is a reliquary its dryness and gradual pace preserving most of what people deposited on their way through. For me, landscape is the big tool for understanding home. House of Rain is about landscape, from the, the largest scale to the finest grain, how the land is treated by the wind and weather. It's about how we fit into it, both us here now and those who were here long, long ago. Writing this book, I originally thought that every chapter would end within view of the next chapter. This is about moving on a human scale, watching a mountain range rise up in front of you, pass you by the side, and then recede behind you. This is understanding a place at human speed. But maps do help. Let me show you a map here. This is the map that I wrote House of Rain on, 
the map is the Colorado Plateau and its drainage, basically the whole of the southwest. I was born down here in central Arizona, and I live here now in southwest Colorado. Not a long migration, but there's a lot between here and there. This is Arizona. This is Utah. This is Colorado and New Mexico. And here are the four corners. You can see the, the ring of the Colorado Plateau pressing up through the land, a highly articulated, eroded landscape, the Grand Canyon coming off the west side of the plateau here. And this is where we started, on the rooftop at home, looking across at the LaSalle Mountains in Utah. Then here is Mesa Verde with its cliff dwellings and Chaco Canyon in New Mexico, and the Cayenta region cliff dwellings, Cedar Mesa and the Bears Ears. This is the ancestral landscape. You can cross it from one side to the next, and it could take lifetimes to move through this kind of terrain. Over here, we're on the, we're, we're now here on the east side of the Colorado Plateau. Go across Utah on the west side. I found a small rock art panel there in this region, a spiral up on a cliff face. And maybe small isn't the important thing here because even insignificant sites hold a key, tell you something about where you are. So let's jump over to that spiral. Sometimes you're walking along and you look up and you see a sign, a sign of people here a long time ago. Probably a lot of them, probably here for a long time. And then you back up and you look around, you see where you are. It's really about landscape, about where people end up. There's a reason to be in places, I mean, why are there cities where they are now? You don't just look at the artifact itself, but you look around you at the bigger picture. Where is the water? Where are the mountains? Where are the passes? How do people come through? It's about the shape of the land. If you look around that spiral petroglyph, you'll see other figures. It would be... Uh, It'd be rare for there not to be a larger context around a, a single piece of rock art. You find uh, intricate designs near that spiral that are, that are pecked in, a, uh, an incised horned figure. And then you come down hundreds of feet of boulders from that, that high panel, and you find other sites. You find figures painted in red hematite, along boulder faces, figures of humans gathered together of, of, uh, of more horned or antlered or, or feathered figures. And in the area around that, you start to find pieces of broken pottery and the subtle remains of pit houses. And then you're seeing villages, you're seeing communities. And when you come down into the bottom, you find a creek running through what is mostly very dry territory. There's water here. Where there's water, you'll find people. And that's part of the reason for the, the term house of rain, uh, the, the place where rain dwells, where water dwells. Water has um, greater importance in dry landscapes like this. So it's a combination of of humans and water working together within the larger context of the landscape. This is where you'll find people. They've been called Anasazi or ancestral Puebloan or to Hopi, their direct living descendants, Hisatsanen, referring specifically to Hopi ancestry, while Zuni has its own name for these ancestors, as does Tewa and Akama, etc. There are many names for these people 
who lived in a distinct area with specific material culture. To understand this material culture, I traveled to museums around the country and looked at their collections, looking through drawers and, and hallways full of pots and baskets. But this is not a way to understand ancestry alone. What is the context of these artifacts? It's important for me to see where they were originally found. I want to show you some, some pictures here. This is, um, this is something that I found in Utah, a red seed jar protected underneath a boulder. And this in a cave in Arizona is a, a water basket, probably an Apache water basket. Uh, to give you a sense of context, here is where it's sitting with another water basket sitting right next to it. And here's a drawing of an Oya from one of my journals. This is a cooking Oya found uh, down in, in Arizona. I left all these artifacts there where I found them. Once you see the numbers of, of artifacts in museums and you look at people's collections and their homes and the, the buckets of pot shirts and the, and the drawers full of arrowheads, you see why I leave them out there because the ground is left naked and these things still in place are telling their stories. Understanding these ancestors is not a matter of just artifacts and collections, but also their buildings, their architecture, where they are on the ground, how they position themselves on the land, how they stood out from the dry country surrounding them, building with stone that they shaped and mortar and wood. This is a tower in Southwest Colorado a region of towers that were uh, built mostly in the 1200s, the time of drought and conflict, social reorganization, which preceded them vacating this entire region. Most towers are found in association with nearby springs, as if they were guarding the springs, protecting them. Uh, uh, maybe it was, it was keeping track of who was coming through because you know at these points, people are gonna pass through the land where there are springs. And there are dry springs not too far away from here where if you give them some love, took care of them, I believe they'd start flowing again. Now, if you had come 100 years before this in the 1100s, there was quite a bit more rain and the desert was more lush. And then I'd say these people were in their heyday. Maybe heyday isn't the right word. This is more of a fluorescence. Chaco Canyon, Northwest New Mexico. This is the Pueblo Benito Great House, the largest of the great houses. Its floor plan is about two acres hundreds of rooms stacked inside of each other. There are 32 kivas at least. You can see the circular shapes of the kivas. And this back wall here goes up to uh, just the bottom of the fifth story. Tropical macaws were being brought in here from, from the south. Turquoise was flowing through here. Uh, countless ceramic vessels. Some of the infrastructure they used was made of whole trees brought from 40 to 60 miles away. White pine is found in the construction here, and the nearest white pine is in the La Plata Mountains in Colorado, at least 60 miles away. Imagine carrying thousands upon thousands of trees for the great houses of Chaco. This is what a fluorescence looks like a thousand years later. Since we're in Chaco and down here along Chaco Wash, I should mention that at the beginning of House of Rain, there's a scene where I'm with a friend and we jump into a flash flood and swim it for five miles. I've been asked if that was literary license and no, it's not. We, we swam down uh, Chaco Wash here 
buck naked except for our boots, which we use to bounce off of things. If I took any literary license, it was making the flood sound like it was roaring when it was more of a loud vocalization, uh, this mess of mud and debris, car tires coming down and trees. Uh, if I went back and wrote it again, I would probably mention more clearly the dangers of foot entrapment. Uh, yeah, it's it was a stupid thing to have done. Uh, let's get back to architecture. Kivas are one of the principal features of architecture in the Pueblo world. That's a great kiva there. The ruins of uh, the great house at Aztec, New Mexico. If you want to get a sense of what a great kiva looked like, this is a reconstruction done by Earl Morris in the 1930s. Earl Morris probably excavated more than any other archeologist of his time around here. So he had some sense of what a great Kiva might have looked like. This he built out of the, the rubble stones of the original great Kiva that was here. He also brought in a lot of rock from other excavations he was doing in the La Plata River area, about 20 miles away. When I first arrived here, it was I was writing House of Rain, and uh, I had been walking for several days through the desert when a summer storm hit. Long, hard rain, sitting down here listening to it playing on the roof and the smell of rain drifting through this space. It was spectacular. These roofs of the great kivas could have weighed up to four tons. So this is what they were doing with all those trees they were bringing in from the mountains. They were also bringing in rocks, big rocks. These are limestone disks that were found at the foot of the pillars holding up the ceiling. And these probably came from 30 or 40 miles away, the nearest source of limestone. When they were first uncovered, there were feathers and arrowheads, little artifacts stuffed in here, like offerings. This at least gives you some sense of scale, what it would have felt like to be inside of a great kiva a thousand years ago. And you can imagine the sound of rain on this roof, the sound of abundance in the desert. Their architecture ranges from Chaco Canyon, where fine masonry structures are standing multiple stories tall, to out in the middle of nowhere, where granaries like this are built with mortar and stone, and still holding corn cobs 900 years later. It's not just about the individual sites, the artifacts, the rock art, the ruins, but the landscape that holds them, the country all around them, how they fit into the bigger picture. The bigger picture is what I've been trying to put together. When I originally set out to write House of Rain, I decided that each chapter would end within view of the beginning of the next chapter. I ended up walking in legs about a thousand miles. I took into account the whole of the Southwest, coming up from Chaco north into Colorado, across parts of Mesa Verde, and then into Utah down Comb Ridge into Arizona and across the state through the Cayenta region, the Mugion Rim, Southeast Arizona, and into Northern Mexico. People who occupied the Four Corners and the Colorado Plateau spoke several different languages and were of different ethnicities. They were related to other people that they interacted with, the Fremont to the north with their their headdresses and ear bobs and elaborate, elaborate costume. Uh, Hohokam to the south with their ball courts and 600 miles of irrigation ditches and canals in what is now Phoenix.
This land, the Colorado Plateau and the Southwest around it, was wholly occupied in every direction by an industrious early civilization marked by towering great houses and countless small farmsteads. We are in a landscape of ghosts and memories. You could live here and not know this ancestry, believing that this single plane of us with our cars and telephone poles and houses is all there is, but you find an arrowhead or a potsherd, the ruin of a granary up in the cliffs, and the world unfolds around you. This first episode has been an introduction to the House of Rain. The next part of the story is a closer look at who these people were and what happened to them. I hope you'll join me. Awesome. It's so good, Craig. Thanks, David. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> folks. Thanks, folks, for hanging in there. I know some people were having video technical problems, but hopefully you got you were able to enjoy it. And remember, if if not, uh, YouTube afterwards uh, tomorrow you can we can rewatch it. So, um, yeah. Do, anything you want to start with, Craig, or I'll, I'll look up some look up some uh, questions here oh it's you know I, I i really wanted to do this with you guys because uh like i said because i wanted to take us out there to be in the place and that's i just returned a couple days ago from from being out there um it it's so different being you know i come back to to journals and and a computer and and sit down and, and try to write where i feel like what's really happening is is what's out there um it's i and and everything else is is second best or third best i mean we we look at it through a computer screen um but being on the ground is what is so important because it, it's it just becomes so real there i i think that you you see ancestry in a different way because it's everywhere. You see the flakes of rock, you see the, the potsherds and it doesn't show up as much in, in something that you edit and polish and, you know, write in paragraphs and pages out there. It's, you're putting it together in context. So thanks for the opportunity and thanks everybody for, for sticking around to watch and see what's, see what we put together. Awesome. Thank you, Craig. Um, you know, it makes me want to mention that your description of how you learn through experience as opposed to reading a book, which you learn from reading a book, really hits at the core of Crow Canyon's mission, which is experiential education and people coming out and directly participating in the landscape, uh, working on sites with us, helping us with our research. Um, but that notion of experiential education being the um, most profound way to learn is that's at the core of our mission. And I don't know if you have any more words to say about that, about how, how learning through experience, um, how that's so important and why that's so important. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, I work with you guys. Um, the, as David said, when this opened, we, uh, we did the, the last trip, um, uh, when when was that? It was uh, the year ago, uh, March, uh, mid March. Uh, yeah, it was mid March, and and we I, we took our temperatures and we headed out there. I remember just going, we got to get in the van and get out of here, or this trip is going to be canceled. And we headed out into the backcountry for a week, and it just and that's where I, you know, the trips that I'm doing with you guys, we're we're going out and sleeping on the ground and. And it changes so much when you can see the sunrise and, and you're there to witness it because you're getting this sense of context that you just can't, I mean, you can get parts of it from, from reading something that I wrote or watching a slideshow, 
but where you're eating the sand, <laughs> it's blowing around and getting in your mouth and you're, and you're sitting there watching the, the, this sunrise from a ridge top. It's, I think Crow Canyon is, is, is opening up an avenue, um, letting people get out there in a way that, um, that maybe not everybody gets to experience or maybe not that many people at all. Um, and, and I also think it's, it's not just Crow Canyon and not just me, but it's, it's driving down the highway and pulling over and just stepping out of your car and, and standing there, taking it in, breathe the air, uh, look at this horizon, pay attention to how it changes as you move. I think there's so much more to that than, than anything else we do, the tactile sense of being in the world. Greg, um, I'm going to let David go to the questions, but I had one more and then I'm going to mute myself so I don't talk because you know how much I love to talk. Um, but another saying we have here that guides our work at Crow Canyon, uh, we have a couple. One is that everybody's history matters. And another is that there's multiple ways of knowing the past. And we acknowledge that the scientific discipline of archaeology is one way of knowing, but that the traditional knowledge of native people is another way of knowing. And I believe on um, many of your trips, you've been paired with a Pueblo person or another native person from the region. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about those multiple ways of knowing. For example, looking at those rock art panels and insights that a Hopi person might have uh, that an Anglo wouldn't have. Yeah, right now I'm working on a, a rock art book um, that I actually have to have finished in the next couple of months on the Colorado Plateau. And and I'm talking to a number of, of uh, people from Hopi, from Zuni, uh, because there's a whole layer that, that, uh, that you don't see just by being out there. Um, I mean, there, there's the tactile world that I'm attracted to, but then there's this, this uh, layer of, of history, of actual passed down stories or, um, you know, talking to somebody at Hopi about, how do you how do you react to this place? I was talking to somebody just recently at Zuni about uh, uh, how they come to a rock art panel, uh, and he 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 said, "Well, I I say good afternoon or good morning. Uh, it's I, I talk to it as if it were a person because it is this it is alive and." And I think that this other way of knowing is something that elevates an understanding beyond the just seeing the horizon, just seeing the sunrise. Well, what is the human connection here? What do people remember? Um, uh, and what do different groups of people remember? I, I, I like to spend time at, at sites and just listen to people who are coming by, listen to all the voices of, of okay, this is what a tourist from Ohio thinks about this place. This is what a, uh, a Tiwa traveler thinks about this place. There are so many different ways of knowing that we can layer on the landscape. And, and that, I think, really deepens our, our understanding of it. Thanks, Craig. I'm going to uh, go to a couple of questions here from John. Hi, Craig. In House of Rain, you had a sentence that sticks out, something like, where humans go, atrocities are sure to follow. Is this still <laughs> part of your view of humans? <laughs> uh, that, is a, right in. <laughs> that is a view that I have not shaken. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's the, the more I understand about us, yes, the more I think atrocities follow us. Um, I, and that's something that we're going to get into more in the, the second episode. Um, you know, I was writing about violence in the Southwest because I wanted to say that, that uh, these people were, were human. They weren't some godlike species who didn't war. They did the same things that all humans do. And yeah, atrocities, we, we carry them everywhere we go and they become part of our scars and part of our history. And um, I, interestingly, this, uh, during the, the, um, the siege of the, the Capitol in, in January, I was at a panel, um, a rock art panel of shield figures, of probably 30 or 40 shield figures all in a line. And I was looking at the terrain going, okay, what were they fighting? Who were they fighting? What were they defending? And at that moment that I was there, you know, 
people were breaking into the Capitol. And I was, and, you know, when I came back and heard this, I went, yeah, this has been going on for a long, long time. These, this human violence. Yeah. I, I was hoping my opinion would be changed, but it, it has not. <laughs> there's, there's still time perhaps. Um, Going down, just kind of going down the list here. This is, a, I think, a good learning thing here. Why no photos in the House of Rain in the book? Yeah, um, you know, I, I intend. There are some photos, but but really, I wanted this to be uh, story based, word based. I think there are a lot of excellent books, um, especially rock art books. Uh, that the photographers have put together, but I'm telling stories. So I don't, in that book, I want, I want you to feel my experience and not necessarily see a still image. Um, and I also didn't put uh, detailed maps in there, which um, I, my reason for that is that I didn't want to lead people to places. I didn't want to say, this is about this one place. Uh, what I was saying is, is this happens everywhere. You just need to go out and find it. Don't follow me to this place on the map. Follow yourself to where you need to be. Um, but there, there are some amazing books. Uh, I'm, they're not hard to find. Um, titles aren't coming to mind right now, but a lot of books with photographs. Thank you. Yeah, well, your, your words have led us out into the canyons to find our own, our own treasures, right? Um, Thank you for that. This is from friend, our friend Susan. Uh, while revisiting these places, Craig, did you see things that were new to you or in a new way or in a way that was new to you? Um, well, both. Uh, um, I, I think if I hadn't, like, if, I, if I hadn't been writing about this, if I hadn't been focused on it, I would have seen sites and I would have gone, oh, amazing, look, some ancient thing. But because I was so focused, I had to, you know, had that frame of, you know, really pay attention, really look at this. So even sites that I had seen before were, in a way, entirely new to me. Um, I, and I go back to sometimes the same sites over and over again. I don't know how many times I've been to Chaco. And every time, and I, I don't mean for this to sound trite, but it is new. It is it is, oh, I haven't seen it at this light, or I haven't seen it. I, I mean, I went there not too long ago to film. It was last winter, and and hardly anybody was there. And it was a whole different experience. Or then going at sunrise and sitting in Pueblo Benito, you see a whole new site. Susan, I don't know if that answers your question adequately. But, um, uh, and and maybe I'm maybe everything is just, just constantly new to me. I'm, I'm, I find myself surprised nonstop out there. Nice. I'll read one from Marilyn here for Craig or anyone or Mark. Uh, I feel like baskets are overshadowed by pottery, lithics and other aspects of material culture. I came to the Southwest from California where baskets are very important in different regions throughout the state. So why do baskets get so little respect in terms of admiration, appreciation of them in the Southwest? Weren't hmm. they made for much longer time depth than ceramics? Yeah. Uh, yeah. They were much more of the Southwest history is, is basket based. And um, I think in, in house of rain, I was looking at a, a pretty specific period of time. which was the ceramic period. Um, I've imagined a book on, that I would love to write on basket maker because I think that's where the, that's where there's powerful stuff. Look at the basket maker rock art. Uh, that, that period is so rich. And, and when you're looking at the, the weaving of the baskets, I guess it's similar when you're looking at a painted piece of pottery, you can see the handwork. Um, you can see the burnishing, um, but in baskets, you can really see that, that intricate work people were doing with their fingers. I, I, I think pottery stands out in a different way. It's, it's so bold, especially the black on white or the, the, the decorated wares or the, the uh, corrugated. Um, but I, I would agree the, I, 
what I found in the backcountry, the most spectacular spectacular finds have been baskets. I found um, a 1,500-year-old basket uh, back turned upside down and back on a shelf um, hidden. And, and to look at that in great detail in its place to, to see the it was a basket that I could have put on the table and, you know, loaded a bunch of apples in it and it would have, you know, gone on and done just fine. Those things are so strong. Um, I, I, I think that they deserve um, a lot of attention. Yes. Well, you know, we do love them and respect them. And in fact, um, many of the earliest excavations from the late 1800s and early 1900s focused on contexts where baskets and other perishables were recovered. And there's an amazing woman named Lori Webster and one of her research partners, Chuck LaRue, who are studying, cataloging and studying those perishable materials. And they're both doing webinars later in the year. So uh, you'll really want to tune in for those webinars on the baskets and other perishable materials from that time period. Well, just before that, I taught that uh, that program with Pro Canyon last March, I was uh, I was on a eight day backpack with some friends not too far north of where we were, and I I found uh, underneath a rock art panel and under a boulder where I was sitting taking shade, I found a woven basically a halo, um, completely intact. And uh, Lori and Chuck have both been looking at pictures of it going, don't know what that is. Uh, it's a finished object and, uh, and you can see all the fine work on it. Um, but, you know, is it part of a headdress? Is it, uh, it's hard to tell what it was, but uh, really nice to see that kind of fine detail and sitting there in that place for, 1,000, 2,000 years, and still still in, in great condition. Nice. Somebody also asked to, uh, if you could play the flute more, you'll have to get your album. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll bring it on for the, the second episode. <laughs> um, the next question is um, from Curtis. House of Rain is my favorite modern book. I read it six times and anticipate reading it many more times. It's enthralling. My question for you today, is there a single site amongst all of those you explored for that book that means the most to you? Oh, goodness. <laughs> That's a good question, Curtis. Uh, yeah, that would be a hard one to say. I mean, there's so many sites like the, I mean, just mentioning that basket just took me back to that one place um, where it's one artifact in one spot, but, you know, I spotted that the day before we were sitting up on a cliff top. We were on a 27 day walk through the desert. And, uh, and I looked out into that Canyon. I said, look at that shadow, look at that shade. There's something there. And we walked down the next day and found that basket back in there. And every site has so much context. I don't know if I can answer that. I mean, Chaco, but then I, that's that's too much. I can't take Chaco. It's uh, it's overwhelming. So sometimes it is these these small sites. Um, um, what comes to mind is that that site where we found a basket on the ledge, and and I could there was a crack. It was a hole about that big and it was full of black widow spider webs and I took off my hat and stuck my head inside and saw it back there and it was turned upside down so that it wouldn't gather dust or debris and I could see the hand reaching back and putting it there and you know mentioning that makes me think of the picture I showed of the the seed jar, the red, uh, it was a black on red seed jar. And again, that was the same thing where I could see somebody put this under the boulder right here. And in that seed jar, there was a crack and it had two drill holes on either side and was tied together with yucca twine. And so it's sites like that, that, that strike me the most where I can see the intention of the person who put it there saying this needs to be protected and I can feel that protection. It's, it's sites where I can really feel that. 
I know that's not, I, I could name the thousand more sites. They're, they're all so powerful. Nice. It's um, it's five o'clock. Uh, we can go a little bit longer, but I just want to remind folks who are jumping off at five um, that we'll be back here again next week with part two. So hopefully everybody can join us. Um, and again, there's a link. A link will be coming to you. If you sign up for this one, you'll get the next one. Um, are you open to a few more questions, Craig? Sure. OK. Um, let's see. Here's kind of a, a big one for folks maybe who aren't as uh, dialed in with. Southwest archaeology, but do you feel, do you believe that the people who lived here a thousand, two thousand years ago are still here now? Um, well, yes. I, <laughs> there are a couple of different ways of answering that. It's a good question um, because there is this this view that oh, these people disappeared. They just poof, they're gone. And and no, there's there the bloodlines and the languages and and. Uh, and so many traditions and stories are still here. They're, um, you know, for, for Pueblo people, they're, they're in the Rio Grande Pueblos and uh, Tewa, Akama, Zuni, Hopi. Um, yeah, the direct descendants are still here. If your question is, do I believe they are still here, those actual individuals, um, in a way, I do. Uh, I think that that memory is left in places. And I don't know what it would be called if that's ghosts or if it's just memory voices that, that the stone picked up that I've often wondered about ceramic vessels that as they're firing, do the voices ever get inside of them? You know, the, and they harden with those like a, like a vinyl record. I think there are enough pieces that you can put back together to say, yes, they are still here. Flesh and bones and talking. No, but a different version of them. Yes. And their descendants. Uh, absolutely. They're still here, still, still living. Uh, just like any of us are. Well, and you know, Craig, when you visit um, these places with native folks, they clearly believe they're still inhabited by the spirits of their ancestors. And just as you talked about your Zuni friend, that when he approached the rock art panel, he talked to it. Um, when I visit sites with native folks, they introduce themselves. <laughs> That's the first thing. They like You wouldn't go into somebody's house without introducing yourself and, and saying why you're here. So even if you come from a tradition where that's harder to accept, being there with native people and seeing that connection they have really changes the way, at least for me, I've viewed those sites and, um, and that incredible connection that those folks have with those places. And when I was uh, working on the, my book Atlas of the Lost World about the Ice Age, that was an interesting to go back 15,000 years you know, you're, you're out of this, this local neighborhood of, of centuries. And I, I would walk into some of those caves, uh, Paisley caves in Oregon. I remember that place in particular where uh, human feces is dated back to 14,000 or so 14,000 years ago. And I remember walking into one of those caves and, you know, you're in a pretty spare stripped landscape, wind blasted. And I'm uh, just looking at around and going, are you, you still here? Or has it been blowing wind for so long that you got scraped out of this cave? You know, how long does that memory last? But I remember that feeling of, of, of going, how are you're still here, right? You're, there's still a memory and I can, I can still speak to you. Here's one from, from John. You talk a lot about sight lines and visual connections. Wondering if you selected your own house site with these ideas in mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I could say, yes, I didn't build this house, uh, but I know the people who did. Um, uh, but yeah, um, when actually when I moved here, um, I realized that I have stories that run through this place that predate me living here. Um, uh, that, that when I 
I moved into this house, I don't know, six years ago um, from someplace where I'd lived for 18 years, uh, just a couple hours away. And and I I looked out and I went, oh, I've been here. I know this place. I I am connected by this. Uh, you know, when I was in my 20s, I was I was coming through here. And it's and and so partly I chose to stay here because of my connection on on the land. Um, so I, I think about that all the time. I think, you know, just two nights ago, I was camped out with with my 14 year old up on the edge of a mesa, a cedar mesa in Utah, looking out over the goosenecks, just going, I got to get you up to the spot. We got to sleep here. This is part of part of this line, part of our travels. We, we need to get in on this on this course. So I think a lot of what I do is attached to these lines. Yeah. Nice. It's a, it's an amazing way to, to see and connect things. Um, let's see, there's a, uh, there's a bunch more, there's way too many to answer, but I'm just kind of getting some, um, here's another sort of tactile one. Can you describe what role listening plays in your practice? And thank you for your time. Uh, listening. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, yeah, I was just in an alcove <laughs> just, just a few days ago. Uh, Actually, you, David, you and I were in that alcove, uh, the one with the handprints um, and the acoustics in there. My son went to the other side, you know, maybe about 150, 200 feet away, and we were whispering to each other back and forth across this. Um, I, yeah, I think, I think hearing has in ways more to do with it than anything else. I, I remember I, I traveled with a, um, an old pioneering route finder in the Grand Canyon when he was in his late seventies. And, and he told me that the one thing he was worried, the one sense he was worried about losing more than any other was his sense of hearing that, that, uh, that sight. Yeah, that's fun and flashy, but boy, when you stop and you listen and listen to silence, um, it's, it's a sound that, that unlike any other. And I think it's, it's, so different from light or from touching. I, I think, I think sound is, uh, is one of the, I mean, looking for rock art. One thing that I've learned is, is clap and listen for the, the bounce back and then go see where your, 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 uh, clap is coming back from. I mean, when we were walking, when my son and I were walking down to this alcove the other day, we were talking and then suddenly we heard our voices and we, we found the right spot and just we started going, Hey, 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 you, Hey, you, you know, just, wow. Listen to that. It's, it's amazing out here with all these stone faces reflecting the sound. Great. Thank you. I remember that site so well. I remember seeing the alcove and you, you just shared on online and I thought, Oh, I know exactly where that is. Some places really stick with you. Uh, yeah. Um, just uh, do you want to set up next week's uh, video a little bit or and, and Mark uh, open the space up for you to, to close us out here? Sure. Uh, next week is, is the second episode, which is going to be a little different from, from this one. Um, I mean, this, we're going to jump around to a lot of different places, but uh, I'm, uh, we'll get, we'll, we'll travel off around the Colorado plateau and off of it following migrations to the South. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see that coming together. We just, I just filmed the last uh, little bit of it uh, just uh, a couple days ago. And, and again, Laura Brown, uh, thank you so much for doing the, the uh, all the hard technical work on this and, and thank you Crow Canyon for, for doing what you do. Uh, please consider uh, dropping something in the hat for, for Crow Canyon because it's, it's an amazing group, uh, such a powerful group of archaeologists there, uh, so much commitment to, to this place and to the history, to, the, to, to cultural history, to landscape. And, and I, as I promised, if I said landscape again, I would take a shot. So there it is. Ah. Uh, <laughs> well you earned that craig yeah, it was a fantastic presentation i can't david could 
comment on this, but the number of chats that have come in that have just said how fantastic the last hour was are uh, too many to count. I want to thank everybody who tuned in, and I hope all y'all will um, come visit Crow Canyon as the pandemic ebbs. We love having visitors here. I love showing people uh, campus. Um, we would love for you to see the current site where we're working, to travel with us on trips like Craig or Native Scholars lead for us. Um, it, it really is a special part of the world and Crow Canyon, we feel really lucky to be a part of it here. So uh, we hope you'll continue uh, being a part of the Crow Canyon family and make your way out to the Four Corners and, and come see us as soon as you can. David? Yeah, thanks so much, both of you, Mark and Craig, for your time, and Laura. And um, we look, look forward to a great uh, presentation next week. So thanks so much, and we'll see you all. See you all in a few days. All right, goodbye. Thank you, everybody.